All right. Well, good afternoon and thank you everyone for joining us for the Learning Curve Scale AI's Tech Talk series. Uh, today, we're very excited to be joined by Dr. Yi Song Yu, Professor of Computing and Mathematical Sciences at the California Institute of Technology for a fireside chat on how today's research might translate to industry in the future. Uh, moderating this discussion is Russell Kaplan, Head of Scale Nucleus. Uh, and just as a quick housekeeping note, if you have any questions as we uh, go through the chat, please submit them using the Q&A feature of the Zoom and uh, we'll do our best to address them at the very end. And with that, Russell, please go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Yuri. And uh, it's great to have you here, Dr. Yu. I want to start uh, by discussing some of your work at Caltech, collaborating on building rich data sets with your colleagues there and specifically how building those data sets often requires real expertise for annotation. Uh, how do you think about the scalability challenges that you have and we have as a machine learning industry in getting that expertise for those ever-growing data sets? That's a great question. And uh, first of all, thank you for having me. This is a great event. Um, so just to give a little bit of background, uh, at Caltech, uh, I collaborate with many people working in the sciences and engineering. Uh, many of those projects are with my colleague, uh, Pietro Perona, who has been working in this space for far longer than I have. And one of the challenges there, just to give a concrete example, is suppose that we are uh, working with a biologist who is conducting animal behavior experiments where they need to catalog how many times one mouse, let's say, interacts in a specific way with another mouse, could be biting, could be tussling, could be mating attempt. And there might be hours and hours of video produced. In these cases, the biologist, who in this case would be a PhD student, is the expert. And in some and, and in specialized experiments, they may be the only person qualified to annotate the data with experiments. And so the challenge there is that it's non-trivial to simply crowdsource this or send it to a to something that looks like Mechanical Turk. And one needs to be able to efficiently use the expert's time to be able to quickly do something that approximates annotating the data set so that we can train a behavior classifier in this case. And so these are big questions that arise not only in you know, things that happen at Caltech in the laboratory, but if you think about you know, traffic experts studying specific traffic patterns for auditing for a Department of Transportation for a self-driving car company, or um, you know, looking out for you know, in, interesting behavior in terms of purchasing patterns, or anything like that, you know, in many cases, the, you know, you need to get the experts eyes on the things that are matter in order to provide the right annotations. Makes a lot of sense. But how do you think about um, as the expertise required grows, doing all that routing, um, you know, in some cases you told me at Caltech, there's only a few people in the world who are capable of doing that annotation. So are we going to hit a wall here in supervised learning? Yeah, great question. So this is part of a much bigger project that I'm involved in and includes, uh, you know, a, a loose collaboration with faculty from and researchers from many, many institutions. The basic idea is that as certain pieces of knowledge becomes uh, uh, established, we can train machine learning models to be able to automatically recognize them. And as these machine learning models have the ability to at least uh, say things like, maybe I'm not sure, and then as there's a hierarchy of expertise. So in the case of uh, the, the, in the case that has been deployed by my colleague Pietro and his collaborators is, the, is a bird classifier uh, in collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology uh, where it can, it's, a, it's an app you can download on your phone, it's called Merlin eBird. Um, and it can classify uh, pretty accurately all 500 species of North American birds. Now, one question you might have is, okay, someone takes a picture of a bird and asks, oh, well, okay, what kind of, bird is it, on the one hand, the machine learning classifier might be confident that it's you know, a common bird like a pigeon, but as the species become increasingly rare or found in increasingly rare contexts, then, then the system might ask uh, uh, a citizen scientist who's an, who is an enthusiast uh, to verify whether the machine learning's prediction is correct. And then at some point you have to be able to model this system in a way that says, okay, we're going to, after a few of these layers are passed, it's time to ping a professor of ornithology at some university who's an expert in the species of birds to verify that it's this particular species of rare bird. 
So you have to be able to manage this whole ecosystem of machine learning systems that have some sort of uncertainty quantification and a hierarchy of people with diverse expertise. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so you've done a lot of work in this kind of expertise routing, but once that data gets routed to the expert, there's a whole separate question of what's the best way to provide supervision. And I wanna talk about work you recently published on task programming as a new idea uh, for how to more directly incorporate that expertise than maybe traditional labels. Can you share that, uh, you know, what the thinking is there? Sure. Um, so uh, first a shout out to uh, Alex Ratner who um, published his paper that inspired our work. Uh, Alex Ratner, uh, who's now a professor at the University of Washington, uh, published a paper called Data Programming. Um, and in data programming, the idea is that rather than having uh, the human, a human expert, let's say, uh, individually annotate every entry in a data set, we simply ask a, a human or a team of humans to write rules of thumb. So rule-based domain knowledge, uh, typically expressed as a short program, let's say like a Python script uh, that, that automatically annotates all the data. And then what Alex's work did was they simply averaged, at least in one of their works, they simply averaged all those rule-based classifiers and used that as a label. And they found that, you know, for the amount of time spent writing these programs, uh, you get much more accurate classifiers training on these super pseudo labels than you do actually having these experts can annotate. Now at Caltech, we work on domains that are a bit different. So for instance, in behavior, uh, you might have a video sequence of, of you know, possibly 30 minutes, possibly hours of two animals interacting with each other. Most of the time they're doing nothing. Uh, and sometimes uh, they have a short burst of interesting activity spanning multiple scales, you know, some like a, a mating ritual between two mice can span you know, 30 minutes. Uh, a quick lunging attack can be less than a second long, right? And so what, what we found was that it's the, one of the best ways to use an expert's time is to have the expert describe with rules what a canonical you know, motif, behavior motif might look like, like lunging. Lunging is actually a canonical behavior motif where it's basically one mouse oriented towards the other mouse, and then the acceleration passes a certain threshold and the distance closes a certain way. So that's, that's actually a short piece of Python script that you can write with about 10 lines of code. And once you get a biologist, expert biologist to write you know, 10 or so of these lines of code, we use that as pseudo labels to train a behavior embedding that it turns out in some cases can reduce the amount of annotations you need in terms of frame by frame behavior annotations by a factor of 10. So we have an experiment in our recent paper on task programming, where we went from 700,000 annotations to 70,000, plus 10 of these task programming uh, pseudo labels uh, programs that generate all these pseudo labels. And that was as effective as training just on the, the whole 700,000 annotations. And if you think about it, there, you know, in many cases, have, doing this task programming might just take a, you know, an hour and then Labeling an additional 630,000 annotations might take, you know, days. So where do you think in terms of applications, uh, this paradigm of task programming is going to have the biggest impact versus maybe some areas where it's really hard to inject that supervision programmatically? That's a great question. So I want to take, I want to take that question a step back. Um, there's this revolution of sorts in machine learning right now called self-supervision. Um, and the basic idea, and it's most common in image-based processing right now, is that there's a lot of structure in images. You know, the raw inputs are pixels, but there's a lot of structures, there are objects in painting, the statistics have some spatial correlations, so on and so forth, such that you can exploit substructures in the images to provide pseudo labels. I view task programming as simply an evolution of the current wave of self-supervision where rather than having the self-supervision being driven by fairly generic image-based image features, they're driven by a little bit of expert time coding up all these different pseudo, pseudo labels. And so in, in cases where you know, self-supervision is known to help, which you know, is a lot of cases right now, I see self-supervision and programmatic self-supervision, which is what task programming is, um, being helpful in a wide range of areas. The cases where you, know, you might, see asymptotes where it doesn't where you know how how much it helps might level off um i would have to say that are probably cases where 
you know, the, the, these pseudo labels don't provide the structure needed to actually do the task that you want at the end. Uh, you know, coming up with examples for that, that crystallize that, that case is a little bit challenging, but you can imagine that there's a, that there's a new phenomenon that's happening at a, on, on a certain time scale. Um, that none of the pseudo labels, self-supervision, programmatic supervision captures in a meaningful way, for example. That's a really interesting analogy between uh, self-supervision and task programming as ways to inject expert, expert structure and knowledge into the learning process. I guess one thing that strikes me about that analogy is that there's almost two different sides of the coin. There's how do we take the expert, that expert knowledge uh, to impose a uh, prior on label distribution, right? Maybe a simple heuristic to say this label should probably be this way. Uh, and with self-supervision, I feel like a lot of the time that expert knowledge gets injected as a form of inductive bias, uh, right? For like SimCLR or these other image-based um, self-supervision models to say, hey, if we augment the data in this way, it shouldn't really change the features that much. So do you think um, kind of going on this task programming self-supervision analogy one step further, do you think uh, part of the future of annotation is kind of having experts, whether through programs or other means, add this inductive bias structure uh, to, to kind of constrain models even further? That's a great question. So <laughs> interestingly, I had a conversation with Pietro last night where we were brainstorming just on this topic. Um, and, you know, of course, efficient annotation, especially in images, has a long track record of interesting interesting research um, where things like, um, you know, do you, for segmentation, do you draw a bounding box? Do you try to draw the actual fine grain segmentation? Do you draw a bounding box and a dot of the interior of the object you're trying to segment? Um, so, so people have studied interesting ways to facilitate efficient segmentation and things like that. So these are more structured annotations. Things that look like task programming, I, I call them rule-based domain knowledge, right? So. Rather than building these, rather than think about ways to efficiently annotate a structured concept, uh, we try to get the expert or, or any kind, anyone who has an intuition about the domain, it doesn't have to be an expert, quote unquote, uh, to get their rule based domain knowledge out of their minds and onto something that can be consumed by a program. And that can happen for generating labels, it can happen for generating invariances. Uh, you know, the, the features should be invariant to this perturbation of the statistics. It could be uh, useful for generating um, anything in between, especially when you go to structured concepts. Like if it's two, you know, if it's a bird doing a specific behavior with its chick, the baby bird, to get the chick to, I don't know, let's say try to fly, right? Um, now that that is two animals and a specific behavior interaction between those animals. There's a lot of structure there. You can label the fact that there's two animals. You can label the fact that there's an interaction. You can label the fact that there's a parent and a child. And, and you could do rule-based domain knowledge in bits and pieces along that entire workflow to be able to efficiently tell, teach a computer to have both the inductive bias and have just raw labels to figure out those types of really complex concepts. And of course, you know, this has implications not just for animals, it has implications for processing a traffic scene. You know, uh, you know, there's two, two drivers in front of me. It does it look like one of them is trying to pass the other one? What does that imply about my driving strategy? That's super interesting. It's almost like within machine learning, there's an entire spectrum of where to inject that supervision or knowledge of where invariance should be, you know, going all the way down to using a convolutional neural network in the first place for the image domain and imposing that translational invariance, you know, inductive bias. So the, the idea of having your research and uh, being able to move more and more up the stack to make it more and more accessible uh, to inject that supervision, uh, I think would unlock a lot of uh, unlock a lot of possibilities. One thing I did want to bring up on this is that uh, if we transition to a world where increasingly people use heuristics to take kind of a first pass at generating labels, um, you know. One concern might be there's a risk that that could exacerbate bias in our machine learning data sets, where you know maybe something is true statistically more often than not, but um, to to have a sweeping generalization for that for that trait or characteristic could be really harmful. So how do you think about um, you know that risk and mitigating it while still getting the benefits of these techniques? 
Uh, that's a great question. So uh, this is a tool that you know can be used, can be quote unquote misused uh, in various different ways. And um, maybe just to take a step back, right? So we talk about statistics and data sets that can uh, that are contained in the data sets that we collect that may lead machine learning algorithms to come to models that behave in ways that are problematic. And what and you know, I I think the same can be said about um, humans who create these rules. One of the things that's striking to me is that a lot of the times these machine learning systems that are collecting, being collected on data sets, in, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, the data sets are constructed by humans. This is especially true for text. Uh, you know, uh, GPT-3, which won one of the best paper awards at NeurIPS this year, um, you know, it has, uh, you know, people have been an analyzing and finding that, you know, and of course it's not re restricted to GPT-3, that you know there are biases in, in, in that are being learned there because the data set was created by humans. So, so I think one thing that's worth thinking about is that humans will create, will, will have their biases. Uh, in the case where the model is being trained on things created by humans, you know, there's the raw statistics of the data set, and then there's the, these rule-based rules of thumb that are the result of biased human thinking. One of the things that I like about these rule-based models is that as we can build processes and protocols to manage to audit them. And I, I think that this is in many ways easier than auditing a data set that was collected in, in a potentially problematic way because these rule-based classifiers are in some sense debuggable, they're transparent. You could actually look at them. In many cases, the, the, it's a very short program. So as long as we establish the right protocols, and this is true not just of rule-based classifiers, but also of data collection in general, as long as you establish right protocols, you know, I think there's an opportunity to mitigate that. And I, I would argue that for these rule-based systems, it's actually more transparent once you think about setting in place those protocols. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, there's a very interesting interplay between the interpretability of our systems and the degree to which you incorporate expert knowledge in a structured way, right? And, and the more that you can kind of surface that, uh, maybe the more interpretable they, they could become. Uh, I wanted to shift gears a little bit to a workshop you're hosting at NeurIPS this year. Um, you know, in the machine learning community, we've made a lot of progress on a lot of problems using pure learning approaches, but certain classes of problems are still somewhat intractable. And one of the ones that you've focused on more recently is problems that have a kind of a combinatorial explosion of um, possibilities for a model to consider. And uh, the workshop you're, you've been hosting, Learning Meets Combinatorial Algorithms, is all about combining great ideas from the combinatorial optimization um, research community from with the learning community to, to solve some of these more intractable issues. So I was wondering maybe for those of us in the audience who are more from a learning background, if you could share, uh, you know, what are some of the great ideas from combinatorial optimization uh, that might be relevant for us and, and how do you see those potentially working together? Sure. So uh, just riffing on what we've been talking about, one of the projects that we've been thinking a lot about uh, is the problem of program synthesis. So how do you actually automatically create a program? So just to give a quick example, I suppose, uh, uh, suppose a, a human expert writes a program as a rule of thumb. And from looking at the data, we, we, we feel like you know, the human may have meant something else. And so we suggest that you actually mean this other program that has a lot of similarities to the program you meant, but it seems like a better fit to the data. There are many applications where you, that might be the thing you wanna do. Um, Microsoft and Google have both, uh, I believe, released products where you can autocomplete formulas in spreadsheets. Uh, you know, like you know, this column look. This column of of entries look like the first two columns, initial last name, right? First initial last name. Do you want to write? Can do, do you want me just to create this regular expression that does that from exam from a few examples? The thing about program synthesis is that programs are not fully differentiable uh, in the sense, in, in the same sense that neural architecture search is not fully differentiable. You have to make discrete choices about the architecture. And so you can think of programs as just in some sense, a program synthesis in some sense as a generalization of neural architecture search. And there's an inherent combinatorial aspect to doing program synthesis. And so, if you want to do optimization in a landscape that involves both continuous optimization and combinatorial optimization, because you have to make discrete choices about architectures, 
then you know actually our workshop is a great uh, place to attend. It's this Saturday. Um, we actually have two talks on the topic of program synthesis along with other talks as well. So where do you think, um, I guess, among the many areas to, to reconcile that of the lack of dif differentiability in program synthesis and the fact that so many of our methods today are really based on differentiable programming as has a gradient descent, you know, what do you see as the kind of most promising avenues uh, to, to rectify that, right? Obviously folks in the reinforcement learning community have been dealing with this for a long time and there's many different ways to approximate differentiability uh, with, uh, you know, discrete rewards, but um, what do you think is the most promising path here? Um, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, in the super long run, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I think it, it's, it's hard to predict what might happen more than let's say, you know, 10 years from now in terms of like specific methods that might become popular. Um, I, certainly, I, mean, I certainly would not have expected when I first started my PhD in 2005, that deep learning would become as popular as it is now. Um, of course, you know, some people knew it all along, um, but, but popping up a level, um, I think that um, one of the reasons why program synthesis is so exciting right now is that there are many things that depend on quote unquote raw statistical learning, if you will, uh, that can be really well solved with contemporary deep learning methods. And so because you can assume that that can be well solved with contemporary deep learning methods, that opens up the possibility to study more sophisticated concepts. So one of the projects that I, I, I'm involved in is called uh, Understanding the World Through Code. You can visit it, uh, the project at uh, neurosymbolic.org. It's a very easy URL, neurosymbolic.org. It's an NSF funded expeditions and computing award. It includes experts from both machine learning like myself and experts in formal methods and programming languages. And the key, and the key conceit of the, um, of the project is that if there are foc relatively focused statistical estimation methods, we could literally just throw a neural net at that and, and assume that the neural net will solve that well. What remains is how do we logically reason about these different modules and primitives in a way that can compose interpretable, verifiable, uh, differentiable programs, neurosymbolic programs, that, that satisfy our specifications. And that this is sort of transitioning on towards, you know, best software engineering practices, if you will. So it's gonna be a combination of automated techniques with rigorous theorem proving of verification with good design practices from the software engineering community. Absolutely. Um, so going back to this idea of these combinatorial algorithms to help, uh, to help these machine learning models deal with the explosion of possibilities in, in many problem domains. Um, to me, it seems like a big part of the root issue here is uh, just the paradigm of supervised learning itself um, and how we, you know, I mean, it's been derided by some people in the community as glorified curve fitting, right? Uh, which naturally breaks down once you reach that combinatorial explosion of, of possibility. Um, but I wanted to tie into your earlier research thread here on interactive learning systems and the idea of uh, having a live system that can go collect new data, potentially get it annotated or otherwise supervised, uh, and then kind of learn back from it. Do you think uh, with the ability of a learning system to intervene in the data collection process itself, um, there's, a, there's an opportunity to combine you know, that solution domain and that problem domain uh, to, to learn causality more directly, right? To actually kind of modify the distribution. Uh, or, or do you think that these two are pretty unrelated issues? That's a great question. Um, so uh, I think the, f the field of causal reasoning is, is very interesting. Um, I think the bulk of that field has been focused on what you can do in the absence of interventions or with only observational data. I think, you know, what, uh, going back to the sort of other main thread of research my group works on, which is interactive learning, if you have a causal hypothesis about some aspect of the phenomena of the phenomena that you're trying to model, and you're allowed to do an experiment or make an intervention, um, then absolutely, you know, you should be able to plan experiments that can falsify or verify or, or fail to falsify, if you will, uh, your causal hypothesis. Um, I, I absolutely think that that's very important. Um, I think that unsupervised learning um, is very powerful, but it only gets us so far. Uh, in terms of being able to span all possible domains of knowledge. 
because there are many domains of knowledge where we simply don't have large repositories of data. There are of course, ones that we do, and you know th those have attracted significant commercial interest as well as in research interest, but there are many others that we don't. And um, being able to reason through how do we actually experiment um, and do interventions to form causal hypothesis, I think is a very important research area that will have long-term implications. Just to give one example. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, just to give right, one go ahead. that's maybe a little bit in between. You know, um, uh, in sports analytics, which is another area that I've done a lot of collaborations on, people try to come up with all these metrics uh, and then they say like, this explains a, a player's efficiency, a player efficiency rating. And it's all based on historical data. And then they try to use that to guide coaching and guide strategy, which is an inter intervention. And you see this really interesting interplay in the evolution of sports. So I, I particularly follow ba basketball, um, but you can imagine you know, scenarios where you know, stuff like that becomes more rigorously scientific, if you will. It makes a lot of sense. And, and we've also seen this at scale, you know, providing supervision uh, and label data to so many companies. Uh, going back to that, that question of, okay, maybe when we get started, there's a big batch of data. We want to get it labeled. We'll train our machine learning system and we'll deploy it. And what we're seeing now is over time, companies are more and more thinking about this, not as a one and done affair, but, you know, an interactive process in which the, the model improves, the performance improves, that improves our ability to decide how and what data to label. We improve our annotation strategy. We improve our supervision strategy, maybe not raw annotation, and kind of go more and more to this somewhat active learning loop uh, that uh, really has all the characteristics of a real-time, you know, online interactive system as opposed to a static, a static problem. Um, we have an interesting question from from the audience. I want to interject here from Kiran, um, going back to this idea of what level of abstraction is the right place to add uh, is the right place to add this expert supervision so the question is behavioral structures are difficult data to conceptually design and build and a common issue is that a concept can be explained at many levels or projections of the data so how does one find the right level of structure relevant to the task <laughs> that is a great question and the topic of multiple research projects that my phd students are working on um, so the, I'm going to give you two answers. Um, the high level answer is of course, you know, in, let's say, let's just use, um, let's just use behavior as, a, as an example, because that's a data, that's a data set domain where data is becoming increasingly prevalent, whether it's self-driving cars and traffic scenes or animal behaviors or shopping behaviors, you know, in a store, I guess not right now with COVID, but you know, in general, um, and in that case, let's just talk about time scales, right? There's, I need to avoid a car, time scale happens in the seconds range. There's the minutes, minutes scale, minutes level time scale, and there's the hours long time scale. And you want to discover phenomenon that's interesting to you that you may not realize at different time scales. Um, so in the long run, you would hope, one, as a machine learning person, one always hopes this, that for almost, for an almost, automated system or a semi-automated system that just makes these discoveries at different scales all the time. In the medium term, in terms of projects that my PhD students are collaborating on, so these are projects that you know, might yield promising insights in the three to five year horizon, um, we work closely with domain experts uh, to, under, to get a sense of what they're trying to discover, get a sense of the relative uh, relevant length scales, and then to automate each module individually and then figure out how to connect them together. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so I wanna take that to transition to um, maybe what could be described as one of the central focus areas of your research in general, which is really how do you develop a practical theory of machine learning that's useful for real world applications? And I would preface this question by des describing the fact that you know, as many of us know, uh, a lot of our most successful empirical methods today really lack the theoretical guarantees that maybe we've been accustomed to historically or other uh, neighboring research communities uh, have really more richly developed than we have. Um, do you think that's, is that holding back the field? Uh, you know, what is the role of theory for modern practical ML? 
Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, um, you know, since this is the week of NeurIPS, I just want to uh, give a shout out to Shafi Goldwasser, uh, who gave a keynote talk uh, yesterday at NeurIPS talking about things like privacy, uh, guaranteed, privacy guaranteed private learning. Um, so um, that's an area where uh, theory has a very strong role to play. Uh, because in the area, in areas related to things like security and safety, you know, the, it should be the presumption that something is not secure or not safe until proven otherwise. Uh, and so the burden of proof is on the person trying to make it more secure or safe. So in those types of scenarios, I think it's very clear that theory has a strong role to play. Now, if you're a primarily empirically driven domain where, you know, you're allowed to experiment with relatively low cost um, and, and failures are not so costly and weird corner cases are not the things that can derail an entire process, then I absolutely think that, you know, a lot of the current ways that we go about building machine learning systems, you know, we should just keep doing that. Um, and so as we move learning systems into, into scenarios that are more and more impacting in a direct way people's lives, um, I, I think, you know, we need to uh, you know, figure out the role of theory, depending on the risk tolerance that we, we have for this particular application. And if it's a very low risk tolerance, the theory has a strong role to play. So this makes sense, um, but I want to push on this in, in concrete, you know, real world terms. So uh, but before I was at scale, one of my past roles was as a uh, senior machine learning scientist at Tesla on the autopilot team. And uh, we spent a lot of time discussing this question, right, of how do we get stronger and stronger safety guarantees in the field uh, because we want you know, a zero intervention autopilot product. Um, at the same time, we want to use the methods that are demonstrating the most empirical success. And so when those two methods don't, when, when those two constraints you know, don't directly intersect, there's a question of, uh, of what do you prefer? So I guess in a world where the status quo today is that there is that gap, you know, what is your opinion on uh, what the machine learning community needs to do uh, to, re to rectify it? Is it to, is it to kind of halt uh, some of the empirical progress until we can catch up with the theory? Or is it to maybe in certain cases say, you know what, even for these safety critical applications, uh, maybe we won't have theoretical guarantees, but maybe we could substitute them with uh, some kind of empirical guarantees. Maybe guarantees is too strong a word, but some empirical assessment uh, for, for safety instead. So first of all, I, I, I just want to say that this is outside my area of expertise. I'm not a policymaker. I'm happy to give my personal opinion, but you know, I, this, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm speaking about, the, about, the, about this as an informed citizen rather than as a machine learning expert. So just to state that up front, but it's a great question, by the way. Um, I, I also mentioned that I hope that I can contribute to research so that we can sidestep this question in the future. But with, with current methods, and, and, and current trade-offs. Um, you know, I, and I also want to mention that I think this is the issue that is causing a lot of conflict in tech companies right now, um, where, you know, things get deployed in a way that some people find very uncomfortable, possibly because they feel like it, mistakes will disproportionately impact certain segments of the population. Um, so I, I think this actually touches at the heart of a lot of the issues confronting tech as they embrace more and more data-driven methods in a way without having, you know, these quote unquote idealized methods that sit on the Pareto frontier um, that can balance guarantees with, with empirical performance. Uh, in my mind, personally, um, <laughs> I guess I would say that it would have to be on a case by case basis. And if individual companies um, choose to use these methods uh, and knowing that there's risk involved, we should have a framework to, you know, uh, uh, understand, you know, things like insurance policies, understand, and if things are just too risky, you know, we, some regulatory guidance is probably necessary. I don't think there's a one, I don't think there's a one shoe fits all answer to this because it, there's a lot of nuance, like, you know, the choices you make at Tesla, even for things like highway versus local roads or highways versus garage, you know, there's nuance there. And I'm not privy to all the discussions you guys had had at Tesla, but I imagine there's nuance in all those issues, right? Um, and so, um, I, I would just say that it, there's, I would just say that you know we need better 
social infrastructure to mitigate the risks, including insurance, regulation, and stuff like that. Uh, I, I guess- Absolutely. I yeah, no, it's not, it's not, you're, it's, you're certainly right. It's not just a technology issue. Um, maybe diving into it in an area that is a bit more directly in your area of expertise. Uh, one, one topic you've discussed in this vein in the past is this idea of kind of a Pareto frontier of trade-offs where, uh, you know, in, in maybe one end of the curve, we really need strong, strong theoretical guarantees. And we are willing to sacrifice a lot of other properties of our systems to have that um, maybe where the cost of failure is catastrophically high. And then, you know, in the other end of the spectrum, right, what ad do we show you in your Google search results? It's a bit more okay maybe to be, to be somewhat empirical. Um, you know, I, you've done some work with JPL, uh, with NASA's JPL in the past where you're maybe at one end of the spectrum. Can you talk about that and, and how these trade-offs came, came up there? Sure. Um, sure. Uh, so um, the Curiosity rover is a $2 billion asset. Uh, if we break it, there's no way to fix it. And so uh, safety guarantees are of the utmost importance uh, when, this, when thinking about how to improve autonomy of space assets, such as the Curiosity rover. And so in my collaborations with JPL, you know, we've been thinking about ways to improve the autonomy of space assets like the rover without compromising uh, safety. And so there you have to preserve all the guarantees um, that are required by the, um, by the system designers and within the confines of those constraints, try to make it faster. This is actually another great example of learning meets combinatorial optimization um, or combinatorial algorithms, where if I wanna plan a path from point A to point B on Mars, and I wanna do so with a guaranteed bounded risk tolerance, normally that's, that's the shortest path Dijkstra's problem that we learn in CS2 or whatever. But once you have all these constraints on like not violating risk violations, it becomes an NP hard problem. And so we we're, we took the idea that we want to actually use machine learning to actually just optimize for the planning of the path, and then run the verification software afterwards. So we get all the safety guarantees that we preserve all the safety guarantees, but we just uh, uh, learn the uh, learn the solver. This is actually not that different from like let's say playing Go where you can verify if you've won the game or not at the very end, but there's this combinatorial search path from the beginning to the end of the game. Um, so this makes a lot of sense to me, but what do you think about, um, you know, maybe a system like the uh, Curiosity Rover is, is maybe at one extreme end of the spectrum, right? But there's also a lot of other places closer on earth where, where we face similar challenges. One, we've, one you and I have discussed in the past is uh, with kind of airline, uh, you know, aircraft system. Um, is there opportunity to get safety guarantees, uh, you know, within known thresholds by maybe factorizing the system somewhat? Right. Okay. So um, that's a great point. So in the Mars rover example, the model of Mars is fixed. We don't, we don't update our model of Mars. We simply say, given these really hard safety constraints, what is the best you can do? In other cases, we can say, okay, how do we, even, how do we get more efficient representations of safety constraints, which is more, more like what you're asking. So um, in the airline industry, for instance, the way they think about doing this is that they actually factorize the way you, that you ensure safety. They say, okay, we're gonna actually design a new system, right? What I, what I talk about in the Mars rover is how do we operate the current system more efficiently? They're gonna say, we're gonna design a new system. And so uh, a typical airline uh, airliner uh, has a guarantee of something like, I don't recall the exact numbers, but something like uh, one uh, uh, pro expected value of one of a crash per billion miles flown, 10 to the nine. Um, so then you can say, okay, well, we're gonna build, we're gonna, to, to achieve this guarantee requirement, we're gonna build three redundant systems such that if any of them are successful and are still running, we won't, we won't crash. And then, we'll all, then we just need to figure out a way to certify that these three systems each fail with probability like you know, expectation 10 to the three, 1,000 miles. If they're, and, and then we need to certify that they're independent, their failure modes are independent. Once we can do that, then we can guarantee through the combination of these three systems, a failure mode of an expectation once per billion miles flown. And so there, you know, now we're saying, okay, we need, we're gonna figure out how to figure out how to find the right factorization, which is also, by the way, a combinatorial optimization problem. Um, 
to so so that each individual module we can then verify statistically, if you will, because ten to the three is something that is something that you can actually brute force statistically. That, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, if we can get strong statistical guarantees at a tractable sample size for each component and somehow prove their independence. Uh, you know, yeah, maybe we can reach those uh, those safety levels uh, in in aggregate. Um, so, I wanted to transition from this into a rising topic of discussion in the machine learning community, which is uh, the role of ever increasing amounts of computation in our learning systems. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion about this recently with GPT-3 um, at, at NeurIPS and beforehand. Uh, but in general, I would say there's a strong uh, school of thought in the learning community that views much progress as fundamentally compute bound. And that a lot of the most promising research today that will have a big impact in the future is the school of research that can you know, fundamentally best take advantage of increases in the amount of compute um, that those algorithms can harness. Do you, I, I guess the first question is, um, as it pertains to your research around uh, you know, practical theory and learning guarantees, do you think that these are aligned you know, goals of can we do better with our guarantees uh, with more and more compute reliant algorithms? Or are these somewhat orthogonal or potentially even adversarial? And, and is that tension going to exacerbate as we harness ever more amounts of NVIDIA GPUs? Right, so that question has many facets. Let's see if, I, let's see if we can get through a few of them. Um, I, I think that as, um, so on the one hand, it's certainly true that for certain domains, that um, are very data rich, text and images being the canonical two. Um, these uh, giant transformer networks um, based embeddings uh, are you know, incredibly powerful. And, um, and I think that um, they, if you wanna do research related to that, then being in an institution or organization that has access to those resources is a significant competitive advantage. There's no doubt about that. Um, one thing that I'm not so sure about is that, you know, how long lived that advantage will be. So just to give an example, um, uh, you know, it could be very, it could very well be that, you know, even though GPT-3 was so expensive, uh, training it will become cheaper and cheaper. I mean, people talk about people will try to make these things more efficient all the time, um, such that, um, 10 years from now, you know, you could train GPT-3 for like, you know, $10,000, but, you know. That you will can... be on GPT-7 by then for <laughs> $100 million, all right, so maybe. Good. All right, so, but there's a, there's a question of, you know, what is needed to achieve the capabilities you need um, for, for, for the system you're building. Um, and so it's not entirely clear to me that um, this advantage is going to feel so oppressive, if you will, 10 years from now. Maybe it will. It's hard to predict, but it's not clear to me that it will. Um, the second facet of this is um, there are many domains where it remains extremely expensive to collect a lot of data. So, you know, I, I do a lot of work on uh, autonomy, so AI for robots, let's say. And in those cases, it, it's actually very uh, expensive to collect the data. And the, um, you know, and the simulators in many cases are not that great. In some cases, they're great. In some cases, they're not. Um, and so uh, those are the cases where you need to work fairly closely with domain experts, in this case, aerodynamics experts, if you will, uh, to figure out the right places to collect enough data and model the, mo and build machine learning models that can, um, that can you know, work well on, on that data set. I will also say that advances in large-scale deep learning have translated directly into the smaller-scale deep learning methods. You know, the, uh, yeah, better learning algorithms, bit more compact, efficient representations. Uh, in, for our for our neural net approach for on drones, we use a method called deep sets, which was proposed by uh, my friend Manzel Zahir, who's at Google Brain. Um, that for you know bigger problems, and we just adapted it. So I think progress is cross cutting. Uh, similarly, on the theory to application spectrum, I think for the for the domains that are most in empirical that you can play around and experiment with empirical methods that perform best. And for domains that require a lot of theory, like the Mars rover applications, we, we figure out how to make, build the most practical theory possible. And so my hope is that that cross fertilizes. The last aspect of what you're asking, or, or one of the next aspects, I, I don't remember what was the last one, 
is how do we audit GPT-3, a model like GPT-3? How do we audit these giant models to ensure that, you know, um, or, or at least have some confidence that they behave in a way that uh, we, we want them to? I think that's a great open question. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, my, my default answer is we need to figure out a way to factorize those use cases because a brute force audit is, is intractable. And hopefully at uh, the next NERPS, we'll have you know, even more insight into this question. I want to uh, take the time here to say thank you so much, Dr. Yu, for joining us. Uh, that's, a, that's a wrap for us today. Um, thanks to the audience as well for participating. Uh, if you'd like to see more of Dr. Yu's work, you can check out his homepage um, at Caltech. And if you're interested in uh, scale and adding more and more supervision to your own uh, deep learning methods, you can check out our services at scale.com. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Yu, and have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Take care.